Hello everyone and welcome to uh, welcome to our next snack talk uh, in 2021. Our speaker today is Wesley Clawson, who will be speaking on information dynamics in the hippocampus and cortex and their alterations in epilepsy. I met Wes, uh, well, we met actually online at, at a conference last year, uh, and then I was a, a marker for his thesis, uh, PhD thesis just a couple of months ago, and was uh, was thinking at the time beforehand, before the thesis uh, uh, defense, I thought if this talk goes well, I think, uh, I think Wes will be a good candidate to come and talk in, at Snacks. Uh, and obviously it did go well, so here we are, here we are with Wes. So by way of introduction, uh, Wes's undergrad and, and master's degrees were from the uh, University of Arkansas in physics and electrical engineering. Uh, I, uh, well, I thought I learned today, but it turns out I already knew that he'd done some, uh, some summer internship work with, uh, with Woodrow Shu uh, at Washington University on criticality in neural networks, which is really interesting and kind of explains some of the discussions that we previously had. Uh, he worked in industry for a while uh, at a place called Windstream as a cloud architect. And you know, I always love people coming from industry, coming back to do their PhDs. Everyone, everyone knows that since we all love people that look like ourselves. Uh, and then during his PhD, he's been at ex uh, Masai University uh, at the Institute for, for Neurosystems Neuroscience under the direction of Chris, Christoph Bernard and Demian Battaglia, who I know quite well. Hence my involvement in marking, uh, marking the thesis. So there is research interests were in uh, systems level neuroscience, particularly memory processes uh, through the lens of complex systems and computation theory. He's now in Michael Levin's lab at Tufts University, uh, which again was a really uh, interesting uh, touch point uh, at, the, at Wes's defense. I asked him what he was doing next and he mentioned that he was going to work with, with Michael. And it was uh, quite a coincidence because Ben and Mac and I uh, and our groups had, had watched a talk from Michael Levin literally three days beforehand at a little group uh, group workshop day. Uh, so that was quite interesting. We're very interested in, in the work Michael's doing and it's great to see uh, Wes jumping in there and hopefully bringing a lot of information theory to uh, the lenses of, of that lab as well. Uh, so uh, I guess that's all, all for the introduction. So Wes, over to you and uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you. That was a Wonderful introduction. I think the first time I've actually ever been introduced. It's actually my first talk as a PhD. So this is super special. Uh, Joe gets to hear it twice. And if it's terrible, you can blame him for passing me. Uh, and I am, I'm a little under the weather. I babysat kids after they started uh, daycare and I'll try to mute myself when I cough. Uh, but if I don't, I super apologize. Um, but like Joe said, I'm Wes and this is my talk uh, for snacks. So information dynamics in hippocampus and cortex in alterations in epilepsy. Um, oh, once you know it, there we go. Uh, but really it's a story about um, collectives. So things like bird flocks, uh, ant collectives, or as you might think of it, uh, cell collectives and a process like regen or for the group here, uh, neuroscience collectives of neurons. Uh, what's really interesting about collectives is sometimes when they come together, you get interesting things like intelligence. Uh, so here's the group that's responsible for the work that I'm going to talk about today. Myself, uh, Maiva Ferraris, my supervisor, Christoph Bernard, Pascal Kilikini, uh, Dimian Bataya, Anna uh, Fernandez, Anton Gestem, and then two master students whose photos, I guess, weren't good enough to put up here, Tangi and Benjamin. Uh, but really, it's a story also about organization. When I think about collective things, I think about how they're organized. Uh, organized thing I can think of is this is a library, right? Everything has its place. There's rows. Everything's maybe color coded. There you have the nice Dewey Decimal System. It's very nice, easy, and sorted. Its description is easy, and if you wanted to use it, perhaps to find something, it's it's you know great. Uh, however, the the opposite of that would be something like this. This looted half destroyed Amazon warehouse from long ago. You can see all the books are overturned, some are open, some are upside down. It's uh, the opposite of what we just saw. But what's interesting, what I wanna talk about today is something in between the library and this destroyed warehouse. And it's something like Christoph's uh, office. Maybe it looks like your office as well. Uh, you can see there are signs of order. There are bookshelves. There are technically things shelved on them in somewhat of an order and they're labeled. But then you see there's a little bit of that Amazon warehouse as well, stacks of papers, maybe some trash, an old coffee cup. Uh, and so what I want to talk about today is what type of organization is this, this neural data that we recorded from, from rat brains? Is it like the 
is it like the library? Is it like the Amazon warehouse? Or is it more like Christoph's desk? Um, and more specifically, I'm going to talk about how that organization is related to computation. Um, and what I mean by that is if the brain is some kind of system that takes inputs and may, whether they are internal or external, external, it does something with them and then has some kind of output, again, whether internal or external, we want to say something about how that computation, how that transformation from input to output may be organized. And then as the title implied, um, how is it different in a pathological state? And here we're going to use epilepsy as a model. Um, and aside, I want to talk about computation a little bit. This is my favorite uh, thing that computes. Uh, here, what we have is like a ticker tape. So this is a tape, and it can extend infinitely to the left and to the right. It has little spaces, which can have zeros or ones printed on it. And there's a little thing called a head that can read it. So this can read whether it's a zero or one. And right now it's uh, called the alpha head. What's interesting is it can follow a certain set of rules. <clears throat> For example, if it's in state alpha, alpha, and it reads a zero, like here, it follows a rule. It's going to change that zero into a one, shift to the right, and then change into head beta. And that's what you see here. So the zero to a one, alpha to beta, and it's shifted to the right. Now, if it continues this process through time or steps or whatever you want to use, now it's in beta zero, so it's going to print that as a one. It's going to shift to the right again and switch back to alpha, <clears throat> which it does because it follows these rules. And then the last rule, it's alpha one, and therefore it halts. Whatever it's computing, it's, it's done. So this is the computer classic, the Turing machine, which was made, invented by Alan Turing. Uh, and the big signatures of computation of this Turing machine are state dependent information processing. So alpha beta being the states, it's processing the zeros and ones, the information differently, depending on whether or not it's an alpha or beta. And there's non-trivial state switching. So each of these things, well, they follow. So you have two signatures of computation, state dependent information processing and non-trivial state switching. However, the brain is not a Turing machine. I don't think it is, and I'm not trying to say that. All I'm saying is that these are two signatures that we might look for if you wanna try to look for computation occurring in the brain. And what's interesting is anesthesia provides a really interesting data set when looking at state-based anything. And that is because under anesthesia, the brain will oscillate between these large global oscillations of slow and theta. So slow oscillations or theta oscillations. And that's pictured here on the right in the spectrum. So here, the more red, the more powerful a certain signal is. So you can see it's slow for a long period of time. And then up into the theta range, slow, theta, slow. Great. So if you wanted to look at state dependent um, information processing, alpha, beta, like in the example, here we have theta, slow. And those are somewhat, but not perfectly analogous to natural sleep like uh, REM and non-REM. Uh, so if you wanted to look at information processing in these states, maybe we could look at the spiking data recorded during these periods of slow and theta. And that's what we're going to do here is look at EFIS recordings. Uh, so we'll look at the LFP and the spikes in these periods of slow and theta. So the big question is, is organization related to collective neural computation? Where computation, I'm going to say, is the state-dependent information processing and non-trivial state switching. Wesley, sorry to interrupt, can oh, I ask a question already? Sure. Uh, my name is Rob Sanders. I'm the professor of anesthetics. I'm very interested in those two states. Okay. What, what's the theta dominant state? That theta in rodents is normally an exploratory type state, a wakeful type in, um, rhythm right. rather than an anesthetic rhythm. So I'm interested as to what sort of anesthetic state that was created in. Right. So normally when you hear about theta, especially in rodents, it's always with navigation. So you have that theta cycle that's also tied to breathing and it's also tied to motor activity. Uh, this data is slightly different. It's a little bit lower. I'll show exact values later, but it's closer to five. Um, but here, and I'll go over the anesthetic later, it's a ketamine and xylazine. Right. Um, and for, and I, they're not, honestly, not sure why this happens. I mean, why does anything in the brain happen? Um, but when you put them under anesthesia, especially with this mix of anesthetic, again, and I'll go over the, the specifics of that in a little bit, um, it oscillates between these two states. 
Uh, sometimes if the animal starts to show signs of wakefulness, you can re-inject a little bit of this um, and it will cause a switch into the slow oscillation. Uh, so sometimes in my recordings, we'll cut off some of the beginning of the slow oscillation. Uh, but generally, these are very stable, very steady states. You see here the time, if you can see my mouse pointer, here we're in the thousands of seconds for each of these ticks. Uh, so under this deep anesthesia, uh, they, it's, it's really interesting. Um, in natural sleep, it's not nearly as strong. You have uh, different types of signatures, and I'll show you that later. Um, but under this particular mix of anesthetic agents, you get st not stuck, but you're confined to these two states of slow and theta. Oh, yeah, that's fascinating to me. We, we, I wouldn't say I have a clinical analogy for that, but we should do. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, if you, if you want, and this goes for anyone, if I say something that is very interesting like that, thank you, by the way, uh, I'm happy to provide different references or, or uh, better links to stuff if, you're, if you wanna explore in, in literature. Um, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, so collective computation, and again, we're looking at those states of theta and slow because they are very long, slow, and stable. So if we want to look at information processing in these states, we're going to check in those. Um, but then the question becomes, if the brain is computing, what is it computing? Uh, it's a big lofty question. What is the computation going on here? Uh, so I'm gonna take the framework of Mar and Poggio, which they introduced in 1977. The computation could have three levels. Originally in their paper, they said four, but I'm gonna use three for now because it's simpler. Um, you have the implementation, the what is doing the computing, and then the why, but then there's a level between those two, the how. And the analogy that uh, Krakauer used in 2017 is like a bird wanting to fly. If the computation was flight, it is, what is doing the flight? Well, it's like the feathers. Like without the feathers, you can't have the flight. But without the how, the feathers flapping, you have no why. So you have the feathers, they flap, and you fly. So you have these three levels of computation, the what, how, and the why, or the physical substrate of computation, the rules they follow, and the problem they're solving. Um, here, I'm gonna posit, and I don't think it's it's buck wild, that neurons in the brain may be the what. They might be the, the the hardware that's computing. Now, I think there's a lot of other stuff going on in the brain uh, that we're not gonna talk about here, but if we restrict ourselves just to neurons, neurons are the what, the implementation. However, the why is not easy to answer. Um, and we can talk about that a bit if you want at the end, but we can still look at maybe the how. So if we can observe the feathers, maybe we can see how they're flapping. Or if we observe the neurons, what are the rules of the flapping of these neurons? <clears throat> So even though I might not be able to know what's computing or what the computation is, we could still search for signs of this at an algorithmic level. So if we look at the state dependent information processing and non-trivial state switching. Um, and how are we gonna do that? Uh, again, I'm positing that the signatures of computations, these algorithms could be this information processing. And so what we wanted to do was try to get as close to the what to the neurons as possible, the lowest level of computation possible, very similar to like everyone here, I think it writes in Python and MATLAB, it's a very high level language or Fortran for people who have suffered like I have. Um, you know, you write large level commands doing math, but really deep down below you have the hardware, you have bits flipping on and off and you have an assembly language that's taking these lowest level instructions and working with the what. Now you could have things stacked on top of this, sure, but what if we try to go to the lowest level possible and ask the question, what would be the kind of assembly level language of the brain? Um, and so what we wanna do is measure this, these algorithms, state dependent information processing, and what would that be? So Turing and Langton, uh, Turing originally talked about this, Langton has pushed this a bit further, and a lot of people in this room, the Zoom room, also have done this as well that information processing could be built of three kind of primitive operations. Information storage, so the idea that you can hold information. Information transfer, so the movement among the parts. And then information modification. So two bits of information come together and you need to, to change them. I'm not gonna look at the third one uh, here today, but we look, we're gonna investigate information storage and transfer today. Uh, so that's what we're gonna do. And then thirdly, uh, what is patho pathology gonna reveal about organization? So if we measure some type of organization in a control system, 
great. But without something to compare it to, it's hard to really talk about it. And what we're going to do is use epilepsy as a model system. And epilepsy is diagnosed by seizures. Seizures are the thing. That is what makes you epileptic. Um, but if you go look in the literature, it turns out that the cognitive comorbidities, the EDs, are the, the, the largest complaint by far by the epileptic population. Things like memory loss, uh, sometimes uh, sensory motor problems. Um, and what's really interesting is the people who investigate epilepsy, there's a, a lot of different ways you can get epilepsy. So when you go in, you, the genes have changed, cell signaling has changed, the channels are redistributed, some of them are warped, the synapses have changed all their dynamics, the networks themselves have now kind of warped how they move, so the functional dynamics have changed, partly because of seizures and partly because of these lower level malfunctions. And what's crazy is the more people look, even within a certain etiology, there are many different ways that they can change, yet produce general cognitive comorbidities and things like seizures. So it's kind of like a degenerate system, despite so wide amount of changes, all produce cognitive comorbidities. And generally, people, again, go down to the, the what? They look at the neurons, they look at the genes, the cell signals, they get down really low and say, what has changed? And now how does that affect the why? And while that's possible and definitely a good way to, one way to, in a degenerate system, if everything can change a, a thousand different ways, yet getting the same thing, it's going to be a very hard problem to tackle. But would it be easier to maybe look at the algorithms? Maybe those have changed or not. So in general, kind of how we're going to move forward is if control is normal, um, we're going to look at the what and the how, so the neurons and their algorithms and then see how that's changed in epilepsy. So the what in the control, the neurons, the, the networks here are very different from the neurons and the networks in epilepsy, but how are the algorithms different? So this is what we're going to, to talk about today. So longest intro ever, sorry. Uh, so we're gonna look at EFIS data. We're gonna look at algorithms and neurons, the what and the how, the neurons and how they're flapping despite not being able to know what the computation is through things like state-based information processing and talk about their organization. Where do they lie kind of on this spectrum here? So I'm gonna quickly go through two projects. Uh, one is information dynamics. It's a paper that's already been published and then project two kind of epilepsy. So what we did, and here's the, the slide on anesthesia. So we used a urethane ketamine xylosine mix to induce anesthesia, really deep anesthesia in these rats. And these are acute recordings, so they're put under, they're recorded, and then sacrificed. <clears throat> and we're going to record from CA1 and the meteorol. Did this in natural sleep. I'm going to skim past some of the natural sleep stuff today, uh, today uh, but it's there in the paper if you're interested. Um, and again, we're doing this in EFIS recording. So you get local field potential, so the gross electrical activity around the probe that you're using, as well as spikes. Um, and I think everyone here is familiar with, with those. Um, and we're going to look at four things for information processing state components, like I mentioned before. So we're going to look at the spectra because we want to know what state we're in. And to do that, all you have to do is take the LFP and look at these spectrograms. So here, the power of the different frequencies present in the signal. And here on the left, you see the anesthesia. It's the same graph I showed earlier. So really long bouts, long, steady, stable bouts of slow, theta, slow, theta, slow. It's not really a clock signal, like you know, but sometimes they're not always the same length. This just happens to be a nice picture. Uh, and here on the right, you can see a natural sleep. It's definitely more messy, but you can still see signs of periods of REM or non-REM. Like, keep in mind, you could divide REM even or non-REM into more states, but here we keep it in, into REM and non-REM. So if you go through with a sliding window, okay, for this period of time, was I in a period of slow or a period of theta? You can mark it. So here you have periods of slow, theta, slow, theta. So you've captured kind of the dynamics of this local field potential in a simple uh, label like this. Now, moving on, we're going to go and look, like I talked earlier, about the spiking activity in, inside of these periods. And like Joe talked about just beforehand, we're going to bend a little bit. Uh, so we take 20 millisecond bins and we say if a neuron fired within that bin, it gets a one. If it doesn't, it gets a zero. And then we have a nice binarized file and we can use all the maths that we like. Um, 
And this is a 10 second window with a one second slide. So everything I present here, all the measurements will be taken in a 10 second window with a one second slide. So if we looked at the spectra, the next thing to look at is the firing. First, just look, what are the neurons doing? It's a good you know, thing to do at the very beginning of everything. Uh, because it's interesting, the firing rate could, in theory, remain constant while the neurons that are firing, who is producing kind of that firing rate could change. And that's shown a little bit here. So here's uh, spiking activity from the medial antenna cortex across 67 neurons under anesthesia. <clears throat> and you can see the time bar here is one minute on the bottom. I'll give you a second to look at that. So it's pretty wild. You can see there's a good long time where a certain subset of neurons are firing. Something switches, a different subset of neurons fire. It switches back, changes, and it goes here, and so on and so forth. And I've, if I put those labels of slow and theta on it, you can see that they don't quite line up. Now you could maybe argue that, you know, okay, this is like a, you know, a smudging error or something like that. But even if this delineated uh, period of slow, you can see even within periods of slow oscillations, you have different subsets of run off and on kind of in unison. And so if we uh, want to try- Wesley, sorry, can I, can I ask real quick? I, sorry if I missed this detail. Uh, yep. Did you label pyramidal neurons specifically, or these could be interneurons? These can be, neurons? at this point, they can be anything. Um, Got it. I have some- in the layer three, approximately. Yeah, this is just layer three of medial antenna cortex. Got it, cool, thanks. Yep, and I think I have some supplementary slides later if you want, looking at different of those distributions. Um, for my I get later. in trouble from Ben and Joe if I get too neuro nerdy and, and actually ask <laughs> about cells, so I'll probably be careful. We can do that after everyone leaves, don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, right now, these are this can be any cell. So I'm not saying excitatory, inhibitory, or anything. These are these can be any neurons. And what we want to do is try to talk about how can we capture this kind of weird thing that I see here. And so what we're going to do is build this matrix here. It's a correlation matrix. In the paper, we refer to it as a similarity matrix. So the x and y axis is our time. And so all you do is you take a window, that 10 second window, and say, you know, what's the correlation between the subset of neurons that are firing in window one and window one? That's well, one, so this is dark red. Here, maybe if this period here is very uncorrelated with the subset here, so you'd have a dark blue, but then this period with this period would be red, and then you'd see it again here. So you can build these correlation matrix through time and time, and then run a simple k-means algorithm on it. So this is real data here now. This was a cartoon, this is real. Uh, so here again, time and time. And you see this red blocky structure start to pop up. Periods of very high correlation in time. And if you run k-means, it'll find this. You can see it is in state one. You know, k-means just arbitrarily labels things. So one, three, two, three, five, kind of pings back and forth between five and four, six, four, six. And so if you go through and then you kind of just apply a color on that spiking thing that I just showed you, this is what you get. This, K -mean, this kind of correlation matrix and k-means can recover these different periods. So all the periods of yellow were all highly correlated to one another, the red and then the green. And you go through just like we did for periods of slow and theta and you mark them, boom. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and you can see that- Was just, just one thing, just to make sure everyone's, everyone's with you. Can yep. you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Uh, uh, just, just to make sure everyone's with you, what you've done here is, is that at each time point, you've got your 10 second window. You've yep. measured, for example, your firing rate for yep. each uh, for each single unit. Uh, so you've mm -hmm. got a vector of firing rates at that time window. Then yes. uh, at the other time window you're going to compare to, you've got the same vector, well, the same vector of firing rates at the next window, and then you've done a correlation between those two, and that's what gives you individual point in the matrix on the left. Exactly. Okay, good. That is a much better way to say that than I did. That's all right. Just want to make sure everyone was with you. No, yeah, this was, um, and this is, it's good that you did this because everything is based on this as you already know. Um, so I hope that is clear now after Joe's wonderful explanation. So yes, you have a, you have a matrix of firing rates for every neuron time and time, and you see how correlated are those two matrices. So Basically, the firing rate of a window here would be similar to the firing rates here, 
also. So this is not only firing rate, but also kind of the identity who is creating that firing rate. So two key things. Can I ask a, another question here, Wesley? Um, I don't know if these kinds of recordings are possible in sort of awake kind of moving mice, but um, would you expect that the patterns would be far less stereotyped in a, in a waking mouse? Do you think that part of this stereotypy is due to the anesthesia? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we're working on now, there's a master's student I'm trying to convince to get a PhD and do this, um, <laughs> uh, is everything I'm going to present today is an anesthesia, including the epilepsy data. So there's that huge open question of like, how does this map to like real stuff, like a rat running on a maze? Mm -hmm. um, and part of the problem is the estimators that we use. And I'll maybe if we uh, don't run out of time, the estimators that I use in this study uh, are not that great. So if something like this does exist in behaving animals, uh, oftentimes I think we would need better estimators basically to, to check for stuff like this. Because uh, if you see here, the bar is like one minute. So a lot of these big blocks are one minute plus. Uh, and if you think about running a, a maze, my rats finish their maze in 15 seconds. Um, so if there are interesting state-like dynamics going on while that's happening, uh, we weren't sure how to find that. That is the obvious yeah. next step. And it's what I'm going to be doing in Tufts, hopefully, uh, just not in, in rats, but then we have some new people coming. Are you going to do Chris. them on like worms that you can chop up into pieces? Yeah. And also, <laughs> I don't want to spoil it, but yes, and some other things too. Uh, oh, I'll sick. Try it. I'll try to talk more about it at the end. Uh, we're gonna yeah, so, we're gonna kidnap you and force you to let us hang out with Mike Levin at some point. So just so uh, yeah, right if, <laughs> if anyone wants to bring he or I better together to Australia, you know we're not gonna complain. Or you can come visit <laughs> us in Boston. Um, we would love it. Uh, but yeah, I will be. I mean, as a quick plug for myself, I'll talk about it more. But yeah, I'm gonna be doing. I'll be the experimental information theory guy at that lab. Um, so I'm hoping to do everything you're seeing today and more, uh, but in very weird experiments um, with things like Planaria uh, and Xenobots. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, what time is it? 6.30, okay. Um, so that's what we do for firing. Um, and again, we, we apply these labels and then within a given oscillatory state, so remember this is slow theta, slow theta, there can be many different firing substates. So for example, here, there's one, two, three, four, five. And they're not entirely state specific. Um, so you can see sometimes they appear, this dark red one appears in the dark blue uh, here, but also a little bit here. They, there's some overlap. Um, and we wanna do this with now our information theory measures. So like I talked about earlier, information storage and sharing. And the first one is gonna be storage. So we're gonna to try to find temporal patterns of individual neuronal firing. Um, so if you take a window, a 10 second window, and you take its zeros and ones, you shift it a second, you now have two sequences of zeros and ones, and you're gonna find the mutual information between those two measures. Hopefully everyone might recognize those measure of active information storage. And as a quick example, if I had neuron A, and this is a very short uh, example of, of firing, if it one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, so firing, firing, not, not, firing, and then not, you know, what, what's the next sequence that would have the highest mutual information? You know, what, what do you think? Um, and sometimes classically neuroscience might just look at firing rate, but if you look at firing rate, this would be a valid option as would this one and as would this one. They all have three spikes in the same time bin, the time, larger time window. Um, but in fact, if you look at the mutual information or the active information storage, like uh, uh, Joe introduced, it's actually A2. It's this pattern staying with it in time. So one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. So it's firing patterns, this is finding. So again, this is a single neuronal measure, just like firing, right? So you're gonna have a matrix in the window. You're gonna see the mutual information from one neuron uh, from itself, from a window to the window that just happened. So how much did it store between two windows? And if we build those correlation matrices, just like we did for firing, but for storage, that's what you see here. And you again, get these some periods, of very, very highly correlated patterns of storage across your network. And this is the same recording I showed earlier. So time, 
and time. Red blocks, highly correlated. Uh, dark blue blocks, not. And again, you can run k-means on it, and maybe there's a better way to do this, but k-means works pretty well. And you can pick out these little blocks in the picture. And again, I'm going to color them later, just like I did for firing. But what's really interesting is the relationship between storage and firing is not as simple as you might knee-jerk reaction think. For example, here we have three neurons, A, B, and C. And here is uh, their storage through time. And the y-axis is arbitrary just to keep it in, in a proper scale. But you can see B here, this B neuron, it has some pretty low storage. Storage goes up very high relative to the other ones and then drops back down. So here, my k-means estimator finds that there's a red state, a green, a blue, and a yellow. All the while, the firing rate of the green neuron was five hertz throughout the red and the yellow. So despite resting at the same firing rate, the storage values were changing. And this is a bit simpler to see. When I put the two things next to each other, this is the same recording. And you can see there's an overall kind of underlying, like maybe foundation, like here, these big giant blocks. And then here you can see there's like a, a ghost of those giant blocks, but then little blocks inside. Uh, so they're similar, they are connected, of course, but they are not one-to-one. -one. And again, some of the states of uh, storage appear only in periods of slow, only appear in periods of theta, and some in between, and then the same with firing. Some are exclusive, others are not. And again, if I label the states, just like I did for firing, I get another row of my nice colors. Uh, and again, within the given oscillatory state, there can be many different storage. And again, they're not firing specific, they're not global state specific. There's some interesting relationship going on here. Uh, finally, we're going to do, uh, we're going to measure sharing. And this is more of a spatio-temporal pattern in the network of neuronal firing. So if you remember in storage, it was a single neuron measure. What's the mutual information between its bend firing rate or bend firing from one window to the next? Sharing is that same idea, but instead of one neuron to itself, it's one neuron to any other neuron in the network. Uh, for those of you familiar with the active information storage, you just apply the same thought, but one neuron to any other neuron in the network. So if I give the same example, but now I have a network of neurons, you could say, you know, this temporal pattern, did it go to itself? Did it go to two? Did it go to three, four, five, six? And it's the same example. So this pattern of one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, neuron two repeated that pattern in the next window. So the mutual information will be very high. And here we call it active information sharing. And it was first introduced in a Kearse paper in, in 2016 uh, with Demian Bataya. Uh, and we can identify the periods of pattern sharing across neurons, just like we did for firing and storage. So here's that correlation matrix time. Sorry, can I just jump in real quick there, Wesley? Always. Joe, do you mind, or Wesley, you can take this one if you want, but do you mind um, for, the, for the uninitiated, maybe helping me understand how that's different from transfer entropy? Is it about conditioning? on the previous history before you look for that um, uh, sort of shift in mutual information in time or what, what, how should I be thinking about it? I would love to hear what Joe has to say. I've actually uh, never heard him talk about this stuff. I have the same <laughs> I mean, question, yeah. oh, this is good. <laughs> I was gonna leave it to you because it sounds like a, a pretty easy one, but uh, since you wanted to hear me talk, I will. As far as I remember this one, this is just a shift in mutual information, is, is it not? Yeah. Uh, so it's it's simply, uh, so, so what we're looking at here, I'll draw what we're looking at here, it would be, oh no, blue's a bad colour there, isn't it? Uh, what we're looking at here would be a, a mutual information between these two guys. Let's say, um, let's say this is our target, this is our source. So this information sharing is a shifted mutual information between them where mm -hmm. uh, time's going down the page here. Um, the transfer entropy in contrast would also take into account the past state of um, the past state of the target. So let's do on the right like that to indicate we're taking k past states into account. So the transfer entropy would be uh, would be actually equal to the conditional mutual information between the source, the target, and conditioning on the target's past. So what's different here? Uh, what's different here is that. Uh, we're not conditioning on the target past. So it's 
it's directional in that there's a shift in time between the source and the target, uh, but we're not conditioning on the target past. And if you come back to, um, if you think about the way Wes was explaining computation earlier and talking about state dependent information processing, uh, it's the conditioning on the past that gives you the state dependent view. Uh, so, so that's not here yet. Um, that's not to say this is not an interesting measure. It, it's, it's, it's just a little bit easier uh, to start with. Uh, it's just a little bit easier to start with. And, and obviously that leaves a nice question. If we did add the state dependence, how does that change things down the track? And that obviously yeah. much more, much more uh, scope for future investigation. Yeah. But, uh, but this is, that's thing is, it's not like this is wrong. It's, it's capturing information, sharing over a lag, which is perfectly fine. Yeah. It's just measuring a slightly different thing. It was the, the easiest thing to do at the beginning. Um, and, it, and it turned out with something so striking that we felt like we had to follow it down. Yeah. Um, we almost scrapped it and tried to do a deeper estimator, but then we would have to do it for the other, you know, it was, you know eventually you're gonna continue to work on the same thing cyclically until you, it's never gonna be perfect. So uh, this was step one and hopefully what is a mini step process. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Like your overall question is about capturing uh, the, the neural states in, in how yeah. the information patterns are. And well, that's a perfectly good information measure to look at to try and characterize those patterns. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Good I'll question. Start. No, this is, I, I've actually, I mean, as much as I've read all of Joe's stuff, I've never heard him explain anything. So I was just kind of curious to see what you'd say. So thank you for letting me abuse my position. Sorry. You want um, me to clear, the, uh, clear my drawings up? I mean, you can leave it up if you want, um, but uh, it, it will get in the way <laughs> eventually. I only, I only asked in case you were about to add anything to it, but let's-, let's No, clear. no, it was, it, was, uh, it's, it was a great explanation, yeah. So here, and we did, so in the beginning I did, it was quite co heavy computationally, I did run. So here the lag is always one window behind. So we did do a small little study on, you know, how far can you move that window back? You know, so if it's, a, you know, two windows, three windows, four, and the drop-off is pretty significant. Um, there was some stuff to be found there, um, but at a certain point you're, you'd be asking the question also of like, you know, what did 30 seconds ago tell me about right now? And it was almost nothing. Um, so this was kind of the, the, the easiest, quickest and dirtiest thing to do. And hopefully, I'm hoping in my, my postdoc work to move on to better estimators um, now that you slackers have finally come up with this. <laughs> um, so uh, for sharing, we, we do the same thing. So I, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, so time and time, and you see there's periods of very high core. Ignore the sharing strengths. I'll explain this in a second. But there are patterns of spatiotemporal sharing across the network. Um, and again, you can find them with states. And just like in the other examples, some are exclusive to slow oscillations, some in theta and some in between. Um, and again, you can apply the labels. And now here we have what I'm going to call a semi-complete description of some of the information dynamics going on. We have our large scale states, the slow and theta. You have the subsets of neurons that are firing differently. You have the storage and then the sharing. And again, sometimes they line up, for example, here or here, but it's often the case that they're all doing something differently all at the same time. And I'd like to take a quick aside as like, what are these states? This is something that I've been working on most recently is for me, and Joe might recognize these slides for my defense, is kind of like these, these attractors. So those, that, that firing pattern that I showed you where they were on, off, on, off, like in these big sets, to me, that looks like some kind of dynamic attractor. And they're not fixed points, but more like high dimensional flows. Um, example, state A of the firing, the firing might be constrained to some kind of low dimensional manifold like this sphere. Um, and then a flow along that, a structured flow along that, so this would be a neuron repeating the same pattern. So you're constrained to a certain type of firing, and then you're storing, there's this pattern. Uh, a rotation on a different axis, for example, would be maybe a different neuron repeating the same pattern. And that could be a different storage state. Uh, and here the sphere is just the easiest to draw, but you could imagine it could be any low dimensional manifold. Uh, and then here, uh, kind of this circle, kind of this movement along the surface of the sphere could be that pattern 
moving around neurons. So like a sharing state. So we'd have a firing states, the sphere, the storage states are maybe a certain type of path. And then you have storage states with maybe these movements in a, in a different axis. Uh, and here's a different sharing state. Um, and then it could be the case that when these uh, firing states are shifting, you're passing over to some other kind of dynamic attractor. And so uh, one kind of line of research that I'm currently pursuing is investigating these uh, structured flows on manifolds. I should be very careful, structured flows on manifolds uh, that were introduced, I think, by Victor Girsa. So here in 2017 on uh, symmetry breaking, uh, but also kind of a more readable, uh, not a layman's term one by any mean, but a more readable one in 2020 about structured flows on manifolds is a concept in brain science. Uh, so we have these dynamics in the system. I'm trying to categorize them with things like information. So the storage and the sharing. And what's really interesting, one way to talk about this, these dynamics as a whole is you can imagine that if, if I label all of my states with a simple symbol, like a letter, so B, D, or A, uh, the sequ if I take a vertical slice of this table, I have B, 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 and it repeats B, B, B for a long time. And then I have B, B, A, and then D, D, A, then D, D, C at this little point. Uh, so now I have this triplet that forms a word in, in our papers and in our kind of lingo in the lab was we call these information processing substates, that combination of firing, storage, and sharing. And the sequence of words is what we're proposing forms kind of this assembly language that has a certain syntax. So here I, I've tried to describe the dynamics of our system using information. So the information dynamics of the system. Um, so the big kind of takeaways is that we observe switching substates of firing, storage, and sharing, even within stable periods of oscillatory activity. The substates are generally not determined by global state, uh, and the transitions don't seem to be simplistic or deterministic. And the triplet forms an information processing substate. So like a, the IPS is maybe like the assembly language of the neurons. Um, and because of the questions, I'm running a bit behind, so I'm going to skip over the next point. But the, the, the first kind of big thing is these IPSs. Uh, now I'm going to skip over a different thing, I want to, because I think it's cool. Um, so sharing is, is really interesting. Uh, we talked about it a bit before. So sharing, uh, if you have a neuron in your network, the sharing implies that you're getting some information from certain neurons in the network. And you're also sending information out to certain neurons in the network. So you have a flow. So you have this graphical flow, and that's kind of here on the left. So imagine this is a neuron. It's getting all of its information in time period A from this guy. Uh, the next time, the next sharing state, so this is you know state one that occurs in time A, and then later state one occurs at time B. You have, now it's getting all of its information from three neurons. And then later when it reoccurs, it's getting its information from just two. And when you go and look, What's interesting is that the sharing strengths, the amount of inf being shared in these states, roughly equal. So here, it's always the same amount of information, the same total sum bits in as well as out. And that's reflected here that if you look at the correlation of the sharing strengths of your network, you see there's very clear, highly correlated states. So these blocky red squares, and they're very, very, very red. So they're highly, highly, highly correlated when they occur. Now, if you go and also build the same matrix, and rather than looking at how much was shared, you say how correlated was the assemblies, how correlated was the, the sharing, it's very, very light blue. So despite that structure still being there, it's still very uncorrelated. Kind of similar to as I give this talk, uh, you know, many, many times the same amount of information is, is transferred, but who's hearing the talk is different. So the strengths are very correlated, are very similar, but the assemblies are very, very different. Um, and we wanted to try to quantify this. We called it liquidity because it was like similar to kind of a liquid state machine or something like that, um, where basically the more light blue, the closer to one, and the more dark red, the closer to zero. And here what we see is that within all of our recordings, all of our states, um, you're in this bottom right quadrant of the graph. So here is the assemblies. So again, who the information is being shared with is all down here. And then the strengths, how much information. You notice most of it is very low. So here we have 
the assemblies are changing quite often. So the sharing networks display highly correlated sharing strengths, yet the assemblies display a lot of liquidity. They're changing all the time. It's like a half melted ice cube. Like the outside is firm, but the water is moving around inside. Uh, and Nicola Pedreski uh, did another study on this that was published in 2020 on the sharing networks I just talked about, looking at the core periphery structure of the sharing networks themselves. And I show a brief part of the video. Each dot is a neuron. If the sharing was higher than some very minimal threshold, you see a line connects them. They're clumped together, the higher the strength. And you see that there's some core of sharing kind of in the middle, like a meatball. Uh, and then some neurons are on the outside. So you have a core periphery structure that exists in all of the <coughs> record, excuse me, <coughs> all of the recordings. And they categorize this, um, this behavior um, here. And you can see that some neurons, for example, this green neuron, its coreness measured on the y-axis here was always relatively high. So in that movie, it was kind of always bouncing around in the middle. Whereas another neuron, this pink one, sometimes was in the core with the green, it was very high, but then it bounced down to low, up to high, down to low. It went back and forth, back and forth. And what they did, and I, I won't explain it too much, I'll just say, I, I think everyone should read this paper, it's really great. They looked at various network level properties and then basically categorized, they found four or five different, or four archetypes that you found in this core periphery structure and then categorize the neurons within the states and said, within a certain state, sharing state, what type of archetype was it? Was it a core one? Was it a periphery or these two other ones called regular core skin, uh, yellow or purple? And what was really interesting is that every time the sharing state reoccurred, the sharing, again, the amount was the same. So these states were, uh, built off of the same sharing networks, the same sharing states that I, that I demonstrated earlier. But every time that state occurred, it was taking on a different role. Uh, so this is really interesting. It reminded me a lot about Deborah Gordon's work, who's looked at the changing roles of ants. So everyone thought that the, the life of an ant was very static. You were either a worker or an army ant or something like this. But it turns out in many uh, ant colonies, the, the roles that the ants take can dynamically change based on the need of the community of the need of the collective. So I think there's some really interesting collective dynamics going on here where certain neurons take on certain roles despite overall large scale measures staying the same like sharing states. Um, and we're getting near the end of time and I haven't gotten even halfway through. So maybe I won't talk about epilepsy, um, which is fine. Uh, and we wanted to in the end talk about overall organization though, back to the original question that I, I posed at the beginning, how is organization related to computation? Is it regular, is it random, or is it complex? Uh, or if I give a better picture that looks like this table, if my table had looked like this, if all the states co-occurred, they all changed one and together, and they all had some similar patterns, you would call that a very regular table. If it was very random, it would have looked like this, or if it was something in between, it would be complex like this. And so that's what we did. We used lempel Z complexity, so like I, like I talked about earlier, you transform our tables into words and then you measure the lempel z complexity or something very similar to it. And we actually, the first big finding of that paper was that we found that the complexity of the network of these information dynamics, it was always more complex in periods of theta or rem than it was in slow or non-rem. So across all of our recordings, always theta was more complex. And importantly, all those complexities uh, rested somewhere between order here zero or random here six for built with uh, null models for order and null models for random and you see they lie somewhere in between every time they shifted from slow to theta there was an increase in complexity so complexity is a measure here that we've bounded between order and randomness and that complexity is modeled and results are similar in anesthesia and in natural sleep, except for these two little stinkers. Um, so project one results that IPS organization is complex and modulated by oscillatory state. And again, that's in a, in a paper that's been published called Computing Hubs in the Hippocampus and Cortex. 
if you want to know what a computing hub is, you'll have to <laughs> have to read that. And I'm going to skim through the second half. I'd, I'd rather have a discussion, and we, we ran out of time with questions, but the questions are great, so I'm okay with it. Um, we looked at similar measures in epilepsy, and I'm close your eyes, close your eyes. Um, and we measured basically the same thing in epileptic networks. We looked at the firing, the storage, and the sharing, and asked the question, are, is the organization of our substates of this assembly language in epilepsy, again, is it regular, is it random, or is it complex? And here, just like we did in the first study, we bound the measure of our complexity uh, to zero if it was ordered, and then one if it was random, and found that in every case, we just look at the blue lines and the red lines, we can ignore the axes for a minute, that across all of our control files, and here the x-axis is no matter how I use k-means to cut it up, I, I skipped that part for time, uh, you see that in the epileptic networks, the complexity all goes up in the mediorental cortex, uh, here as well in the CA1. So control- Are you surprised by that, Wesley? Wouldn't you have expected maybe oscillations with epilepsy that might have had lower complexity? The, uh, actually, the yeah, that was my hypothesis going in. Uh, mm. Hold on, I'm about to cough. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you and in you're probably about to talk about it, but- No, you're fine. I, I was, but it, it's, it was at first. Um, and uh, th there's some stuff we can, we can talk about if, if questions there, if we feel like it, about what makes something complex. Um, so we've tried yeah. to investigate I guess what? you could have like oscillations that wandered around in terms of the focus. And so that would look complex in terms, over time, but the signal itself is relatively oscillatory and has low information content. And so thinking about things in that way probably exposes a whole bunch of, like I'm thinking a little bit of, um, uh, Terry Sanowski has got this really beautiful paper about um, spindles. Yeah, um, the sleep spindles, REM, right? Yeah. And it's like this like oscillatory, <laughs> like loop that's whipping around the brain of the RTN turning yeah. on and inhibiting whatever it's touching. And that looks really complicated. If you have a single electrode sitting on a scalp, it looks like this really weird waveform. But if you look at it from the right vantage point, it's just like this little circle, like going around a yeah. carousel. And so it's like, depending on your vantage point, one thing can look complex even when it's not or vice versa. Yeah, no, you're totally right. Um, so it could be that it is more complex just due to our vantage point. Uh, before before I get to that, I will I want to explain this graph just a second, and then I'll I'll, I'll point something out. Um, what was interesting, I think at, at first sight, is if I take my table, if all my tables from my recordings, um, and I order them to the best of my ability. Uh, oops, I clicked on Zoom. So if I took all of my regular table or all the tables and I and I ordered them to the best of my ability, basically sort and make sure I can make them as regular as possible. That's zero in these graphs. What's interesting to me is that the control data was really, really low, like 0, 0.0. Like it's, it rests actually pretty close to, to what would be a forced regularity. Um, and the complexity increases, but not you know, up to 0.8 or something, something crazy, right? It goes up, but not, out, not outlandishly slow. So it led me to kind of investigate these complexity things in terms of like, what, what should I expect and what would be good and, and what wouldn't be good? Like, is it okay that I'm more random or like why would, would I wanna be random to begin with or would I wanna be complex to begin with? Um, and let me find, um, oh, let me hide these. Um, your question just makes me wanna skip over to this. Um, <clears throat> Wesley, like, just sorry to interrupt again, but just before you get on, I'm, I'm still not sure of what the two groups are in that contrast. What What is the epilepsy group and what's the control group? In this graph? Yeah. So blue is control. You mean uh, which line is which or? No, no. What, what, what are the states? I mean, is control under anesthesia. So you've got a low complexity state because it's an anesthetized and then an right. seizure on top of the anesthetic state. Right. So let me... I went fast because of time, but if, sure, uh, sure. Um, so for the epilepsy data, it's, it's exactly, uh, not exactly similar, but the setup is very similar. So we record from the same two regions <clears throat> and this is PILO and Carpin induced epilepsy. So you have a single injection. There's a large status epilepticus. Uh, there's a lot of network level damage. And then after a latent period, seizures start to begin. And then they're put under this large amount of anesthesia. 
so here under this anesthesia, there are, are no seizures um, because of the heavy anesthesia. What we tried to do is pair up these two data sets to be as similar as possible, except for the fact that this has been damaged by a large status epilepticus event. So but the so control so data is collected under anesthesia. Yeah, they're both collected under anesthesia. Yeah. Correct. So that probably so, explains why the controls got low complexity, right? Compared perhaps, to like yeah, state. perhaps if I come up with some nice way to measure complexity, maybe in a behaving animal. Um, but what's interesting is I'm gonna go back to here. Um, if you notice the dots here, so it's hard maybe to see me if I blow it up. So the darker dots are anesthesia and the lighter dots, uh, the darker dots, so yeah, so sleep, sleep, anesthesia, anesthesia, anesthesia. And if you notice the complexity in our first study uh, between anesthesia and natural sleep weren't all that different. For example, the medial natural cortex and anesthesia are all my orange dots. CA1 and sleep, the complexity was in a similar range. Natural sleep, and, and, and again, it's, it's not anesthesia. We, we implanted them, let them rest for a while. And then these rats weren't even doing any training. We were just letting them live their lives. And when they slept, we recorded and tried to find long sessions of sleep. So the complexity of the natural sleep guys were in a similar range to those of anesthesia. So I don't know if the anesthesia is solely responsible for the, the low complexity value. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, it's something I am interested in looking into further. Our current hypothesis <clears throat> is that uh, epilepsy basically whips back and forth into stereotypical behaviors and causes the reoccurrence of states. Um, and Joe, do, can, I, can I keep going? I know we're like way over time. Um, what's yeah, the... Yeah. Uh, basically, okay. people need to go to meetings. They can they can drop off. Okay, uh, that's fine. Ben's already had to go for a meeting and sends his apologies, but uh, to say to say thanks. But um, yeah, keep okay. going, people. Uh, people Great, can stay around, they will stay around. Okay, so we wanted to to, to look at the states inside of epilepsy. Uh, now that I I can talk a little bit longer and people are interested. Um, so to look at the states, we wanted to see what actual activity made up the states. Like what was the population doing in state one or state two or state three? Uh, so what we did is came up with this measure called contrast. So for all of your, so well, let's focus. So for all of the neurons that I record from, I find their mean firing within a substate in a light blue substate. So for 60 neurons, I don't know how many are here. No, 44, because I can read. So for my 44 neurons, each neuron has a mean firing in a certain this light blue substate when they were in the light blue and then i subtract their global mean so if across the whole recording i find the mean activity and then i divide by the global mean so here it's kind of you're looking these bars are representing this measure of contrast how far are you kind of swinging or drifting from your global mean within a different substate and you can see just by eye that the light blue state and the dark blue state are very very different so that for me is a, a also more confirmation of like the states are catching something different. And we do this for firing uh, storage in the example, there's, there's three here and then here five. And then for sharing, there are these different profiles. And we wanted to ask, how was this measure different between control and epilepsy? And so that's what's here on the measure uh, again of contrast. So what you do, is for every state that I find in control, I have basically a long list of contrast values for all of my control states and a giant list of contrast value for all my epileptic states. And then I find the mean difference between the two. So I randomly sample a bunch of them, take the mean difference, throw it in a bin, and then continue and continue and continue and do it many, many times. And what's interesting is this number is always negative. So here's the distributions, the black dot being the mean, the, the darker bar is the, the 95, and then the thinner bar is the 99. And here, this red dotted line is zero. So what's interesting is epilepsy, the, this, this measurement is always negative. Here, it's in the medial antenna cortex, but it's true also of CA1, that the contrast, kind of how much they're swinging back and forth across the mean, is always higher in epilepsy. So I think 
my hypothesis hypotheses for what's happening is while the control values are kind of shifting their profile of what they're doing in each state, maybe it's a bit more structured, like I kind of alluded to the structured flows. For whatever reason, those flows are a bit a bit more wild. Uh, you could, if you want to use that word in epilepsy, basically they're swinging back and forth way more. And I think it's very stereotypical of epilepsy to, to have large scale synchronization, large scale activity like that. And I think it's because of that, it's creating uh, odd states. And that's why uh, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why you see a lot of the increased randomness. And what's more in uh, both meteorotoretics and control, we wanted to measure again, this state specificity. So when you found a state, did it occur only in slow or only in theta? In the first paper, we just had these nice bars and you could just see visually that this distribution. But here in the second one, we wanted to put a number to it. So what we did is found, if you have a state, what's the probability you find it in theta minus the probability you find it in slow? So zero would be perfectly mixed because half and half. Uh, one meaning it's totally separate, whether it be theta or slow. And so here, uh, ignore the, the x-axis I skipped over for the sake of time, but here you can, across any of them, it doesn't really change, which is nice. Uh, the control files here in blue, you see that are very close to one in the meteorological cortex. So they're, they're well separated. So you have some things that only occur in slow, some that only occur in theta, and some that occur in between the two. Uh, for the hippocampus and CA1, similar trends, just slightly lower. What's crazy in epilepsy is, especially in the medial antenna cortex, and again, a little bit in CA1, is this goes way down. So closer to 0.5, uh, but it's really around 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So what we're seeing is not only do you have more contrasted states, so the activity of the population is kind of wildly rebounding between these different profiles of activity, whether it be firing, storage, or sharing, not only that, it's mixed around within theta and slow. That is, I think, one of the biggest things contributing to the increased um, randomness. And to accentuate that point one more before I, I try to wrap it up a little bit is I talked a little bit about <clears throat> when you look at these states, you can apply a label, AAA, BBB, and you look at these IPSs through time, you can also categorize so if there are, for example, three firing states, three storage states, and three sharing states, there's only so many different ways you can combine them together. Here we define that as the maximum dictionary. So I can make only so many words. And then you ask how many words did they exhibit given the possible dictionary? And in epilepsy, that number in the medial anatomical the cortex goes down. So the, the, the states are not mixing like they used to. So I'm, not only are they not mixing, they're more distributed across slow periods of slow and theta. So you're getting closer to that random table of kind of thing, uh, things mixed between slow and theta. Interestingly, in CA1, we saw an opposite thing. This went up and I have searched and searched and searched and ha literally have zero explanation. Um, unfortunately, in all these studies, we couldn't do um, slide studies afterwards. So we couldn't go and count how many neurons had died, what kind of physiological changes were there. Um, Mac, if you had those questions. Uh, unfortunately, because of the setup and at the time, these were old recordings, it wasn't possible. And I'm thinking it might have to do something with that. Um, maybe CA1 historically in pilocarpin is affected differently than the medial internal cortex. So it could be something like that, but we're yeah, there's a there's a really uh, exciting and emerging literature looking at the effects of acetylcholine on emergent dynamics in the hippocampus that mm -hmm. we're particularly interested in for a completely different reason. Um, but that that was going to be my suggestion was that some kind of effect of the particular anesthetic that was used, which was a sort of non-traditional anesthetic. Um, pilocarpine is not one you see often. I was pilocarpine was for the epilepsy, the anesthesia. Oh, sorry, for epilepsy. Yeah. Sorry, um, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the, the anesthesia, I'm not an anesthetist, but I'm pretty sure it's a relatively standard animal anesthesia. But it isoflurane I be, or something? Uh, isoflurane uh, to, to get them to sleep in the very beginning. And then um, uh, it is 
uh, sorry, urethane and a mix of ketamine xylazine. Okay. Yeah. So can I, can tell me can if, I yeah, yeah. jump in on anesthesia? I feel like it's the only reason I'm here. But um, <laughs> the, No, the, Rob, the, we love having you here for your accent. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wouldn't do any other accents. So urethane, I mean, it's been known for years that urethane gives you this cycling under uh, anesthesia. Obviously, we don't use it clinically because it causes cancer. So um, we've kind Uh-oh. of abandoned that. But and ketamine xylazine is the cl- classic rodent or veterinary anesthetic. I haven't seen yeah. the combination much, but it, it's super interesting. I mean, uh, this idea that you can classify these two states of a- under anesthesia with um, these network uh, effects uh, is absolutely what we're trying to do. And what the, I actually, you might have heard, but I took a screenshot of your spectrograms at the beginning because I needed to keep looking at them. Yeah, I can the- send them to you if you want. <laughs> Well, a bit, what you've got there when, you, when you've got this theta dominant state is also a, 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 an increase in what we call beta, which animal physiologists don't, which is around 30 hertz and a decrease in the delta power. And that ratio of beta to delta power in humans, we've found dis- distinguishes whether people are conscious under anesthetic or not. Mm, so I'm okay. not necessarily sure that I would, you know, I'm interested in that, that this kind of ratio of beta delta under the anesthetic could signify an actual different um a conscious state um which is like a dream state versus an uh, um, an unconscious state where people report no experiences and so underlying the actual physiology of that is absolutely critical i'd love to talk more about that sure Uh, Um, i'm less convinced about the epilepsy stuff because i think you just need a non-anesthetized control to really make inference in that yeah yeah it's um so one of my the main point of my PhD work was to do that. I actually did a lot of behavioral um, tests in animals with epilepsy, so a a working memory trial. And then the plan was to also record, uh, and they were freely moving. The the whole setup was really wonderful. I worked really hard on it. Uh, And then construction shut it down um, for a year. And then when I got back to it, I had a whole cohort ready to go. One guy implanted and COVID hit, and we had to put all of our animals down because the vet center closed. Uh, And by the time COVID lifted, I just didn't have enough time. Uh, So unfortunately, I I didn't. Now we actually, it's buck wild. Maybe you're interested in this. This uh, guy came in and we built a 24-hour recording suite with NeuroPixel. And he put it in an epileptic animal and recorded like, I think, over a couple of days using a NeuroPixel and a control animal. Uh, It's the data set's absolutely wild. And they do it it in um, control animals as well. And now Christoph wants to put two in. It's weird. Um, but what was interesting, you know, I wanted to, to because you talked about the ratios, um, so control and epileptic, um, animals. So here are the control epilepsy and then control and epilepsy. So here, the peak frequency of the slow was around one Hertz. And then again, in epilepsy was around one hertz, somewhere slightly higher, but not really. You can see here, this is the mean difference between these two distributions at zero. And then again, for the theta between control. So the actual peak frequency didn't shift. Um, and again, in CA1, we saw the, the only, there was a little bit of a shift. So CA1 seems to be more affected. So there was lower slow oscillations in the hippocampus. I mean, slight. Um, but however, theta was quite a bit lower. And then we also looked at um, the average power of those things. But interestingly, I'll try to blow this up so we can see. Um, We wanted to look at the average power and the ratios of the power. And what's really interesting is that despite some of the power shifting, the ratios stayed well enough in line. Like there's some kind of relationship there that was was held in epilepsy, uh, which is really interesting. And if you're, I, I only know so much about some of this stuff. If you're really interested, I would probably point you to, to Pascal, who is, I would say, the resident expert on that stuff at ENS, um, because it's really interesting and she's continuing work on, on some of that stuff, I think, in the future. Um, yeah, I think it'd be really interesting if you, if you redrew your classification around the, rather than being around the theta versus delta or so, like, and you looked at those ratios, um, mm-hmm. whether you get different um network components which kind of underlie those states that could then ma- potentially be mapped more to um human physiology um, okay. i think that would be really that's a good point good. um i guess 
uh, we've been talking now, so you know the 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 whole thing is relatively off kilter. Uh, but I guess to, to finish before I let anyone else ask questions, uh, to go back to kind of the the big questions I asked in the beginning, um, is organization related to computation? What's computing, and then what pathology reveals? Uh, I think we found you know decent evidence for inf storage and sharing states. Um, but like we talked about earlier, they're really, I mean, dirtily estimated, right? So they were just quick plug and play, uh, plug in estimators. So that could definitely be improved and it's something that I wanna do in the, in the future. And we didn't thoroughly explore state switching, you know, never did I show transition probabilities and things like that. We started to do it uh, and then we got distracted with some other stuff as it always is. And it's, you know, on that list of things to do um, like using hidden Markov modelings to, to see kind of what are these state transitions like, but because the tables were complex, I would argue that you're going to find something, we'll find something interesting. Um, and what's more is I, I think the algorithmic level of biological function in general, especially in neuroscience is, not an explored avenue. Uh, so it's relatively novel-ish, but you know, um, however, like I mentioned in the beginning, interpretability is difficult because we don't know what's being computed necessarily. Uh, it's my big gripe with a lot of uh, some neuroscience studies I've read recently is those assumptions. Um, and the organization was complex. So I think that there's non-trivial relationships between brain state and computation. So those periods of slower theta, or like Rob suggested, perhaps some ratio that's in there there's, that are maybe not necessarily top-down control, but they're somehow guiding these lower dimensional manifolds, which is causing certain things to happen. Um, and then the epilepsy stuff, uh, of course, there's definitely more work to do, but it opens up a huge window of if we, we still saw evidence of algorithmic states, like those states still exist that I didn't go over it quite into the same detail I did, but they're still there. Uh, so is that a general property of distributed systems like, like the neural system? Um, and maybe the algorithmic level is more of a direct casualty of structural changes and then propagate to higher levels like cognitive comorbidities. May it be helpful to investigate that rather than how all the little different pieces have changed. And then uh, we have a student in the future that's gonna extend some of this to other pathologies, like for example, Alzheimer's. Uh, and, and again, here's everyone that I worked with. Um, so Christoph Bernard and Pascal Kilikini really guided me a lot as well as uh, Demian Bataya. And in here, are the, the teams that were there. Uh, and then coming soon, you know, definitely should you know, say that. So I am at Tufts at the Levens lab uh, asking similar questions like do organi organisms reuse algorithms and strategies across different spaces. You know, physical space is only one space that organisms navigate, whether they be aware of it or not. You know, they also navigate transcriptional space or genetic space. Um, and are the algorithms similar across those spaces? Uh, can relationships between algorithms and behavior be established, especially in really interesting cases like um, fungi where the behavior is morphology and very easily tracked? Uh, and then can algorithms be manipulated? Uh, in Mike's lab, they can manipulate uh, morphology using you know, kind of a bioelectric code. They can grow two butted worms or two headed worms and regenerate them into whatever shape they want. Um, and then also are algorithms translatable? If you find an algorithm in one rat or one organism and you wanna investigate another, is it gonna be the same? Are there some principles of maybe these algorithms, these structured flows that are similar and translatable. And then also my big question, what happens when you, the body and the environment that that body is in and, and the algorithms and behavior are artificially linked. For example, if you have brains in robots or if you have um, xenobots attached to Twitter, um, you know, what happens when you play with environment, body and mind and where does things like problem solving and intelligence on whatever scale you're talking about come from as a, an effective uh, collective activity. And for me, a lot of that comes down to measuring things like information dynamics in these organisms. So thanks everyone. Uh, sorry, we went over, but it was great questions. Um, I'm happy to stick around, you know, and, and chat. Uh, so thanks snack. And also everyone that gave me money <laughs> during my PhD.